Hallelujah. Y'all doing all right? All right. Well, hallelujah. We got some guests here today. I appreciate you coming. Uh, a lot of places you could have gone and you decided to come here. And I appreciate it. So glad you're here. I'm going to continue the sermon that I began two weeks ago. It's a new series about really what, what really matters for the rest of your life. No, what's really important? But there's some things that we ought to be focusing on that are important uh, because they have great value. Uh, and we do have the rest of our lives. We don't know how long that'll be, or it may be uh, two minutes. Some of you are going, oh, is he talking about me? <laughs> Maybe two years. Maybe 200 years. I don't know. Nobody knows. But uh, whatever we got left, we need to work with it. And we're using for a text from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. This is the New Living Translation. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you might live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in you in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. I told you last week that uh, Paul addressed this issue of what really matters. And the question is, do your missed dreams really matter? The things that you really wanted to do with your life? You know, when you were uh, just a child maybe, or as a young adult, and you set your target somewhere, and you didn't make it. Does that really matter? Um, what about childhood fantasies? When I grow up, I want to be a ballerina. I want to be a fireman. I want to be president of the United States. I want to be something, and it didn't happen. Uh, that's about the mistakes you've made in life. Do they really matter? Do you have to live with those forever? Is there ever any, any way you break out of that? And, and can you ever start over again? Can you ever get a fresh breath of life and a fresh start in life? And maybe more importantly, if anything, does the rest of your life really matter? Does it matter? Well, I'm here to tell you that it matters to God. It ought to matter to you. And it matters to the rest of us living here. You have value. And that's the issue that I addressed uh, last week in the this series is going to cover a lot of information, but last week we talked about uh, change of your life. The sermon title was, uh, How Can You Change the Rest of Your Life? And a brief recap of that is, I spoke first of all, in the first point of the sermon, about how you can change the rest of your life. You understand who you are. You're not just some as I told you, protoplasma that crawled out of the primeval slime and hung from a tree and swung down here to a pew. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's some fairy tale somebody made up. There's no proof of any of that stuff. The proof we have is that God created you. He created you. And he, cre he, he was involved in the process from the conception in your mother's womb. And he is now residing in believers. Those who believe in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within them. You're not your own, the Scriptures say. You've been bought with a price. And it's been a tremendous price that has been bought for you, and that greatness resides within you. We have such low self-esteem. Oh, I'll never be anything. I'll never go anywhere. You know, just when I die, uh, just put me in a crocus sack and throw me in the bayou. Let the fish nibble on me. You know, that's about how we think of ourselves sometimes. And we just don't realize that there's greatness within us. When you deny the greatness of God that can happen in you and through you by his power, you deny God and you relegate yourself to a life of regret. I can't tell you how many people I've met in my life who have lived just regretting Oh, well, I could have done this. I, you, know, I, you know, I might have done that if it wasn't for this, you know. And living with excuses and regrets about yesterday 
which can never be repeated, and forgetting about the possibilities of tomorrow that can be started right now. You don't have to wait for some event to happen. The event is you just did it. You're still breathing. That's the event. You're still alive. Christ still dwells in you. And there's hope for you. The question is that I have for you, and I told you last week, what will it take for you to become a believing believer? When are you going to start believing the promises of God? I, you know, I threatened to charge you $100 for last week's sermon. I should have done it. But I think we have some back there, DVDs and CDs. If you can't get one, go on the Internet. You can watch it on the Internet. But this is a powerful piece of information that I don't have time to go through this morning. I went on to say last week, the second point was you discover how to live again. There is a way for you to discover how to live again. You were created to be fruitful. In the book of Galatians, it talks about the spirit, uh, the fruit of the spirit. It says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what I ask you to do is to examine yourself and see what fruit are you producing. And gave you some ideas of how to produce some good fruit. The things I spoke about last week is uh, about the fruit of the Spirit is love. But sometimes the fruit of our lives is indifference. We don't care about anyone. And I told you that uh, the fruit of Christ Jesus living in you, one of the names that they gave for him is he's the bread of life. He was interested in feeding people and being involved in their lives. That's what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. I spoke to you about joy. Or, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, but so many of us live in sorrow. We never see any good in life. We're always walking around like the little guy in Little Abner comic strip, I believe it was, had the little black cloud over his head. You know, woe is me, nothing good ever happens to me. It doesn't happen to the guys in a comic strip, and it doesn't happen to people who won't let the fruit of the Spirit dwell within them. Jesus said that he was a lily of the valley. You know what a lily does in the valley? It gives fragrance and beauty in the midst of hardship. And that's what God wants you to see those things, he wants you to be joyful. Talked about peace. Fruit of the Spirit is peace, and so many of us live in turmoil, living in a war zone. Some of you strap on your guns and you go shooting up everybody you can find. You know? To just watch out for you because here you come and you're going to cause trouble along the way. And you don't have any peace. Jesus said he was a prince of peace. That's the spirit of God in you that should be coming out. And what I want to pick up on that I didn't finish last week in this same topic, in the fruit of the spirit, is patience. Do you have patience in your life? Or are you just irritable all the time? Do you wake up in the morning just irritated that you have to get up? And go to bed at night irritated that you have to go to bed? And then irritated with anything and everything in between? So to have patience. Let me tell you something, friends. This is the best advice you're going to get. Not everybody's wrong that you know. Some people are telling you the truth. You just think they're wrong because of your irritable situation. Jesus said that he, the word says that he was the morning star. You know what the morning star does? It announces a new day. Scripture says the compassions of the Lord never fail. They are new every morning. That's what you ought to be living. That's where your life ought to be. Not in irritation, but in patience. Learning to have some patience about you. For the Spirit is kindness. Is your life lived with harshness? Are you a harsh person? Are you always, you know, just gruff? Mr. and Mrs. Gruff. Always wanting to get your way. If you don't get your way, <laughs> you better get out of the way. You know that old thing, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If, if you ain't happy, ain't nobody around you ain't happy. Instead of letting this kindness begin to flow out of your life. Instead of Jesus, one of the names they said about him, he is a wonderful counselor. You know what a counselor does? He listens to other people. 
and he does his best to try to help them out of a situation. You ever try to help anybody? Or you just bring out a hammer and beat them in the head? You know? Because they're, they're never right, and you're 100% right. I hate to burst your bubble. You're not 100% right. Some people who know you probably say you're lucky to be 5% right. Because that's the way they look at you. They got the same problem. Fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And you find yourself living in evil. You have a sin-laden life and you can't get any victory over it. You're wallowing in sin. You're born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you're just laying in a mud pile of sin. Never getting away from it. I'm always amazed that people walk so close to the line trying to decide, is this sin or is this not sin? You ought to be way off the line. Way, in the way, way, way ahead of all that stuff. Jesus is our Redeemer, the Word of God says. He redeems us from a life of sin. We don't have to live in that any longer. Sure, we might stumble and fall, but some of you fall and won't get up. You think there's no way out. You're stuck on that way of life. You thought I was going to say stuck on stupid, but I fooled you. I didn't say it. But I just said it, bro. I'm just hopeless. I just, there's no hope for me. I just don't know. Don't so unkind. I'm so unkind. <laughs> so the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. We live with apathy, you know? Just no effort to do anything right. You're just content to be living like the way you're living. And you know what I'm talking about. This is no mystery to you. Where's the fruit of the Spirit that should be coming out from you? Jesus said, the Bible says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end and everything in between. He didn't quit caring about you. He cares about you every day. He wants you to have a better life. He wants the fruit of the Spirit. You know, if you, if you take a bottle of wine, a fresh new bottle of wine, If you want to keep it to last for a while, you, you know, you put a cork in it. But if you're not careful, it'll wine will go bad, even with a cork in it. And that's what we do with the Holy Spirit. We just put a cork in our lives. You put limits on yourself. We talk about glass ceilings and all the ceilings of life. Man, you've got a ceiling that nothing can get through. You can't even get through it. It's made out of impenetrable whatever. And you will never let yourself believe that you can do better and be better. Through the Spirit is gentleness, not harshness. Jesus is a good shepherd. A good shepherd watches over things. I told you last week about the, uh, the scriptures that says that God plants a choice vine. Clear the land. So if you put a choice bond in there, he put a hedge around it so nothing could in. He put up a watchtower so he could make sure that he kept a, a good watch care over his vineyard. And he watered it and fertilized it. He said he expected it to produce good fruit. He said he got there. He found the, the Hebrew word of, about what he found is like little hard, dried up. Raisins that just have no softness to them at all. And they want to know why. So what more could I have done for my vineyard than I've already done? And each of you have to answer that question. What more could God do for you than what he's already done? And yet you've got the Spirit of God just corked up and won't let him move. It says self-control. The opposite of self-control is chaos. Fulfilling every appetite of your flesh and your mind and not fulfilling the Spirit of God. Do you know that every thought that comes into your mind is not from God? Some of it's from the devil himself. Some of it's from you. You just conjure it up yourself. And you believe the devil in yourself before you believe God. Scripture says that Jesus is the Lamb of God. You know what the Lamb of God is? He gave himself for you that you could have a rich, full life. The rest of your life can be that way. 
I want to show you a scripture that, uh, from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. And it's, uh, Jesus then told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. You identify with that? Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it yet another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. I believe the Holy Spirit intervenes for you. And God's mercy wants to give you more time, more time. But you know, this story is just a story. The reality is God gives us grace beyond measure that we could produce the fruit that he wants to produce in our lives. If you're not fruitful, that's your will, not God's. You hear me? If you're not fruitful, that's your will, not God's. God wants you to be fruitful. You might say, well, Pastor, what does he want me to do? He wants you to pay attention to the rest of your life. He wants you to see the value in it. And if what you're doing is not producing the fruit of the Spirit, what are you supposed to do? Change it. Stop it. Do something different. Say, well, I've always been this way, and you'll always be that way as long as you think that way until you begin to think differently. So, Let's move on to today's message. Oh boy, you thought I was rough on you last week. You hadn't begun to see roughness. You'll be crying for me to preach those sermons about Jesus and what he did. Well, that's exactly what I'm doing, <laughs> all right? How can you change your home for the rest of your life? How can you change your home for the rest of your life. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. It's uh, the last half of verse 11 and 12. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. Some of you ought to memorize that scripture and learn the secret of what Paul had learned. Just because you are married is no assurance that you have a good marriage. Now, some of you uh, here may not be married. Uh, you may be widowed. Uh, you uh, may be divorced. Uh, you may be uh, Never have married and contemplating marriage. I don't know who's watching us over the internet. We have quite a few people who watch us, uh, not, not just live, but who go back and look at these uh, sermons. Uh, so I don't know everyone who will be watching, but I want to give you some information about marriage, no matter which your situation may be. There are forces that are working this moment to destroy your marriage. If you're married, there are forces at work to destroy it. Living together does not give you a happy home. People say, well, we've been married for 40 years. And the old joke was, and the guy said, and, uh, you know, I don't regret a day of it. It was on a Tuesday in 1996. That's a joke. Eh? You're supposed to laugh at that one. Did I say it wrong? No, I was married for 40 years. I don't regret one day of it. It was on a Tuesday in 1996. I don't know. Maybe I scared you too much. Mm. Having children does not make you a good parent. Some of you are crummy parents. Sometimes you see the fruit of your children, you see the crumminess of it. How many of you went to, don't raise your hands. How many of you went to school to learn how to be a parent? How many of you studied, read some books? How many of you went to seminars? How many of you invested part of your life how to be a good parent? Say, well, I'm a good parent. I got kids. Oh, yeah. 
That's why so many kids are so messed up today because you got parents who don't know how to be parents. Having money does not make you happy. I know lots of rich people who aren't happy. I know rich people commit suicide. Oh, if I just had a million dollars, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. Because you'd have a million people trying to get you a million dollars, and that'd make you miserable right there. Be, listen, being a Christian does not make you happy. Some of the sorriest people I know are Christians. It's a shame, it's an indictment. You've got every, the, man, you've got Christ, the creator of the universe, dwelling within you, and we live such shallow lives. You know, we live like instead of having Christ living in us, we got the lowest angel in the ranks who couldn't pass the angel ranks living in us. Or something. Marriage is a reflection of your relationship with Christ. Show me the way your marriage is, I'll show you a lot about the way you treat the Lord. Ooh, that hurts. I, don't like, I didn't like saying it when I wrote it down. I don't like saying it now. But there's a lot of truth in that. And some of you said, oh no, I love the Lord. Well, boy, I tell you what. I wouldn't want to be married to you the way you treat your husband or your wife. Sometimes. I don't know if I'd want to be your Lord the way you treat him. Sometimes. Children or life's work. It never ends. I thought my kids left home and that'd be the end of it. That's not the end of it. It goes on and on. They got grandchildren. You know, just a, it's, a, it's a thing of life. But your children are not going to make you happy. It's a life's work. You need to invest your life in them. But don't over invest. Every once in a while, you need to cut that umbilical cord. Reggie figured that out. He moved into a place so small the kids can't come. <laughs> it's got room for him and mama. That's it. There ain't nobody coming there. Picking on Reggie. Reggie's shaking his head, yes, so. <laughs> <laughs> Your finances are a means for you to support your Christian habits. God prospers you so that you can be at work in the kingdom. Some of you are holding on to your money. You still, you haven't learned how to give yet. You can give like I used to give. Reach in my pocket, all the change in my pocket. I used to play, put it in the plate when it came by. That's why we don't pass the plate. I don't want to embarrass you putting that change in there. So let's look how you can, you can transform your marriage. Let's look at the positive side of this, all right? The first thing you do is you realize that your marriage does reflect Christ, okay? And let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 32 and 33. This is a profound mystery. You ought to pay attention when Paul said that. A profound, not just a regular run-of-the-mill mystery, but something profound, something that's Wow, this is a, an attention getter. This is a profound ministry, uh, mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. What was he talking about? Husbands and wives, family. He said, this is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Most marriages start without Christ or any spiritual input at all. That's the way most marriages start. I've, I've talked to enough people and done enough weddings and asked enough questions. I guarantee you uh, the questions about getting married have very little to do with God. Why are you going to get married? We're in love. Oh boy. We fell in love. Let me tell you what. Love ain't enough, friends. It's not enough. A lot of you people were in love and ended up divorced. What happened to love? Turn to hate and bitterness. Love is not enough. People get married because of sex. Either they want to have sex 
Oh, they're having sex and they think you ought to get married. A big reason. You know, a lot of people got married just because of that. Pregnancy. Somebody's pregnant. We got to get married now. You're pregnant. <laughs> I'm sad to say that in today's society, that's slipping away. Shows my age when I even say that. They don't even think, think about it. Oh, that's a beautiful little baby. Uh, how's you and your husband? Oh, I don't have a husband. People get married because of finances. Well, it's cheaper. Two can live cheaper than one. No, they can't. Because two becomes three and four and five. And then find out how much money you really need. People get married because of peer pressure. Uh, well, Susie got married. Joe got married. Maybe your parents wanted you to get married. Maybe you thought getting married would get you out of the house. You get so tired of your parents telling you what to do, you're going to get married and have peace evermore. <laughs> Wrong. Those are, all, those are just some of the reasons why people get married. Marriage, listen to me, marriage needs a firm foundation in order to survive, and that firm foundation is Christ and the Word of God. The reason to get married ought to be this. I'm so in love with Mr. Wright or Miss Wright that I want to spend the rest of my life making God's goal and plans for their lives come true. Whoa, that'd be a change. Being concerned about the person you love. What does God want for them? What can I do to make their life better? Not about what they can do to make my life better. It's one of the reasons people fall out of love. We're in love so long as somebody's doing something good for us. As soon as they stop, that's it, I'm out of here. I don't put up with this anymore. As I said earlier, living together is no proof that you have a good relationship. Some of you live in misery. Some of you just ducking your heads. Are you talking about me? Sure I am. Your marriage isn't what it ought to be. I'm talking about you. Like your marriage ought to be beautiful. Paul said it's a reflection of a relationship of Christ. What is the relationship between Christ and the church? It's beautiful. It's filled with life and hope and expectations and trust and the fruit of the Spirit and all those things. And if we don't see those things in our lives, many times it's because we don't have those things in our relationship with the Lord. We treat God with the same indifference we treat our mate. Oh, come along, God, we're going to church today. That's Sunday. Oh, well, not this Sunday. I'm going fishing this Sunday. Maybe next Sunday, though. I'll be there. Oh, God, I'll pray. I'll pray tomorrow. I can't pray today because, you know, I got to, man, I, gee, I got to go to where and just whatever it is. And you look at your watch and, you know, and God said, huh, what about me? Do you care about me at all? Remember me. I'm the guy who died for you. I'm the guy who forgave you of your sins. I'm the guy who wants to be with you all the time. Can I go? And you might respond, oh, you wouldn't want to go where I'm going, Jesus. Just, it wouldn't be any fun for you. Then we treat our mates the same way. We just ignore them. We never communicate with them. We never tell them how much we really care about them. Oh, we, we say, I love you. Pat and I have got a thing. It's, it's, uh, we, we just use numbers. We just say, one, four, three. And then we respond back, one, four, three, two. You know what that is? I love you. You know, one, four, three, two. I didn't want you to go home worrying about that, not knowing what it was. Secret, mm. Secret code. Secret code. We've got, we've actually, Pat's got little statues of numbers. And we move them from one side of the room to the other. It'll be on her dresser for a while, because I put them there, and she'll move them over to my dresser for a while, and they'll be there for a while. And then I just move them back. I mean, just so we try to keep this thing fresh and going. And, you know, like the, uh, what was that story about the, uh, the guy had been married for like 50 years and his wife said uh, uh, he was dying and uh, she said, you know, as he was going, she said, 
you know, you haven't told me that you love me since the day we got married. And now you're dying, and I want to hear it one more time. He said, honey, if anything would have changed, I'd have let you know. <laughs> Marriages suffer when the source of true happiness is absent, and that's the presence of Christ. You know, I, I've been criticized for the people that I've married through the years. I've married people nobody else will marry. Somebody's been divorced once or twice, man, nobody will marry them. I do it. I do it all the time. Because I don't care about the past. Let's just go on with the future. There's nothing you can do. It's over with. You get the divorce certificate, it's over. You can't do anything about it anyway. But you know who I won't marry? I will not marry an unbeliever to a believer. I just won't do it. Some, some of you uh, know this uh, firsthand. If you come to see me to get married, the first thing I talk about is your relationship with Christ. Everybody, they ask, would you, would you do my wedding for me? Oh, why don't you come see me? Let's talk about it. They wanted the yes or no. I want to talk about it. And then when I get down and to talk to them, say, tell me about your spiritual condition. What's your relationship with Christ like? Oh, well, I came up in a Christian home. My mom and dad took me to church. You know, I received Jesus when I was uh, 13 years old. I was baptized in water. I'm serving the Lord. Great. Who's this bum you with? Well, tell me about your spirituality. Oh, well, you know, I don't believe in God and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, man, I don't know. But I love her. If I can't lead him to the Lord, I won't do the wedding. I just won't do it. Because the scripture says... There, you shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And a lot of people have, and maybe you're here listening to me right now, have miserable marriages because you're married to somebody who doesn't know Christ and you're trying to build a, thing, a foundation on the way there is no foundation. Amen. I know you didn't want to hear that, but that's the truth. Some of you have to pray them in. It takes a long time sometimes to pray somebody in the kingdom. Sometimes it never happens. And you live this miserable life where you want, your marriage could be great and it's not because of that. Paul gave some instructions about marriage. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, do you love your wife that way? Well, of course I love my wife. I didn't love her, I'd leave her. I might do it better if you left. The way you treat her, Love her as Christ loved the church. What a model, what a standard that's been set for men to do. How does Christ love the church? Paul goes on and explains it. He gave himself for her. Are you giving yourself for your wife? Or are you so worried about yourself that, well, she's okay, or she's not okay? You know how many times Pat and I sat, sat down to, to consult with people who thought that their marriage was okay? because the other person wasn't complaining, sometimes they just get tired of complaining. I had an elder in his church and his wife come to sit in our sofa at my house and say, she says, I want a divorce. And he's stunned. And he says, why? She said, I don't love you anymore. He said, why not? Because you don't love me. You never do anything that tells me that you love me. Guy's an elder in the church, a spiritual leader, a great guy. And let his marriage go right down a tank. Fortunately, because they had a good foundation and knew the Lord were able to save that marriage. Thank God for it. But it was in bad shape, really bad shape. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Let me get something straight right now, and I'm on record for this. Submit is not a dirty word. It's a combination of two Greek words. One means under, the other means order. A lot, a lot of what's wrong in marriages is women who will not submit to their husband's leadership. Husbands are not loving, wives are not submitted. 
Oh, well, yeah, you know, that was back in them days, preacher. That doesn't matter today. Yep, and let me tell you what the divorce rate is. I've told you this before, but I'm going to repeat it now. When Pat and I got married, I'd been through a divorce. I wish I was squeaky clean. I wish I'd have started serving the Lord when I was eight years old, but I didn't. And Pat and I met and fell in love. She was just what I wanted. She was educated. She was beautiful. She was smart. She was independent. And I didn't have to worry about her. And I didn't want to worry about her. I wanted her to be my wife because I was in love with her. But I didn't want to have to worry about her. I let her take care of herself. That was my idea. And we were married for five, six years. And our marriage, second marriage for me, was about to go in the tank. And fortunately, in God's divine mercy, he showed up in my life and I got saved, gloriously saved, and Pat got gloriously saved, and then we had to figure out what the heck we we're going to do with the rest of our lives. I treated her so bad I should have been put in jail. Because I didn't worry about it. And then I started reading the Bible, and I found out I was responsible for her. I was supposed to take care of her. I was supposed to provide leadership for her. And I wasn't supposed to put burdens on her shoulder that God never intended for her to carry. That's my job. And I said, uh-oh, because she married me and, and didn't want to be. A, she didn't even heard the word submit before. And she began to study. She began to learn. We did this together. And she found out that she had to trust me that I would take care of her as Christ would take care of her. And not to be afraid that, not, not on every little minuscule decision, but when it came down to the big stuff where we had to try to make up our minds which way to go, she would trust me. And I'd make those decisions, and I didn't put those burdens on her. And she'll tell you it's the right thing to do. We've learned it. It took us years to figure that out, by the way. It didn't just because, oh, we were saved, hallelujah, we know Jesus, we could, we're learning all the songs of Zion, running around with a bunch of Christian new friends, and it didn't make us good husbands and wives. We were still in big trouble. We got out of trouble when we decided to do something about it. Get books, go to seminars, pray, learn. That's what we did. And we've come along pretty good, huh, baby? We're doing all right. We're not perfect, but we're doing all right, huh? We got a bunch of years under our belt. I'm looking forward to a lot more. We've, we've got a motto in our home. Divorce never. Murder, maybe. I don't keep the guns loaded at home, just in case. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> we are told to submit. There's a lot of things we need to submit to. Submit to civil authority. Submit to Christ. We don't seem to have any problem with that. Why not submit to our husband? Ladies, I'm not making this up. It says the husband is the head of the wife. Is Christ is the head of the church. Oh, well, I don't know about that. I didn't know that. Nobody told me that before I got married. Well, you should have got me to marry. You gave me some marriage counsel. I'd have told you. But you wouldn't have heard me anyway. Especially young people, they never hear anything. They never hear anything. Man, if I just could have that girl, I'd say anything. If I could just have that guy, oh, just want to wear that wedding dress. Woo, I want to walk down the aisle. I want to be beautiful for a day. Well, the wedding dress comes off and the bum shows up and the marriage begins. People always worry about the ceremony. I don't care about the ceremony. That's why, I've, that's why doing a marriage is such a big deal for me because I just don't want to do a, you know, do you take, do you take, amen, get out of here and take yourselves out of here. You know? <laughs> I'm worried about what happens to you afterwards. Spend a lot of time with people before I marry them. Try to tell them the truth. I don't hear a whole lot of the truth. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit unto your husbands as unto the Lord. How do you submit to the Lord? Do you do what he tells you to do? That's not a fair question. 
Well, that's a good question. Tells you a lot about your relationship with the Lord. Talks about a lot of relationship with your husband and your wife. You can disagree with me, but I'll tell you what, I got a track record of talking to people. I got experience. I am an expert in this matter. Sometimes think that moms and dads and pastors who understand this ought to do some uh, arranging marriages instead of the way we're doing it now. People falling in love. People fall in the ditch. Sometimes falling in love is just like falling in a ditch. Christ, listen to me, Christ fulfills your needs when you become a believer. Then you look to your mate to fulfill their needs, not yours. Some of you think your mate, you're dependent on your mate to fulfill your needs instead of you looking at them to try to fulfill their needs. What do they need? How can you make their life better and richer and fuller? I don't have time for all this stuff, preacher. What time are you getting out of here? I got to go. Let's get the baptism done and go home. I want to read something to you. Somebody gave me. One of the people that I did a wedding for. Who didn't. Found out the topic I was going to preach on. And it just says, I won't read the whole thing. I'll just read to you some of the important parts. It says, good timing is always right on. Your upcoming message on marriage is right on time too. As Tommy and I celebrate our 11th anniversary yesterday, May 13th. This is Fran and Tommy of our church who are not here today because they went to a, a reunion. I know when Tommy and I got married, we both felt blessed by the Lord. I also know that with both of us being married twice before, the chance of our staying married was against us. Eleven years ago, we asked the Lord to be a part of our marriage. We conversed with him daily, each in our own way. And he has been faithful in responding to our prayers and requests for guidance along the way. We're still together. And I am thankful for Tommy in my life. I sat down with Fran and Tommy before they got married. In fact, I asked her permission to, to read this to you. And uh, they sat in my office. And I said, tell me about yourself. Because I didn't know them that well. They told me, I said, you've been married before? They both have been married multiple times? And I just told him the truth. So the probability of your marriage lasting is almost zero. You got, you got hardly any chance at all. It just won't work. Because the bad habits you had in your first marriage, you brought to the second marriage, and bad habits you had in the second marriage, you're bringing into this marriage. And if that didn't work, this won't work either. Statistically, the, the third marriage never works. Almost never, statistically speaking. But I said, I can tell you a way to make it work. You build your relationship on Jesus Christ. And he becomes so important to you that you do anything to maintain that relationship. And in order to maintain that relationship, you're going to have to love your husband and love your wife. And we talked about it quite a bit, and we prayed quite a bit. And they both made a commitment to God, not to me. They made a commitment to God to do that. Fran goes on and said, the card I gave him yesterday fit very well. It reads, our love has been a journey. The card continues, I couldn't have known when we first met that everything in my life before then had been leading me to you. But looking back, I realized that every decision led me to just the right turn and that every road, taken or not, brought me one step closer to you and the love we share. Today, I know for sure that when our paths came together, we found one another. It was really only the beginning of the most beautiful journey of all, a journey of two hearts that beat as one. His call to me read, I love you with all my heart, and it continues. When things are changing all around us and the world seems to move too fast, don't forget I'll be right beside you, loving you. What I feel for you is deep, total, and enduring. A love that can count on, that you can count on without ever having to wonder. So when you look ahead to the future or look back to how things used to be,
Don't forget to look beside you. That's where I am. Loving you with all my heart. Closes. God is good and faithful, and we know that he loves us. Wow. Isn't that something? That's something. That's people putting some investment in their relationship. Their relationship with God. I'll tell you what. This may be out of vogue, but when the church doors are open, Tommy and Fran are here, doing what they can. She's back there teaching those kiddies. Best little uh, the children's church teacher I've ever seen. She, she prepares for those kids as if she was going to get up here and preach a sermon and it would go out into the whole inter- universe on the internet. Put a good foundation, helping parents to raise their kids. That's what Fran's doing. Second thing I want to talk about is you release your stresses into Christ's hands. You release your stresses into Christ's hands. Let's look at Philippians 4.12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You know how Paul did that? (laughs) He experienced it. We go through stuff in life. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. Some of it's a hallelujah day, some of it's a oh my God day. It's just the way it is. Never know. I woke up uh, the other morning early, went to the gym, worked out, ran on that treadmill, got my cardiovascular going, came home, ate a big bowl of cereals with blueberries on it. Man, I was feeling good. I had my day planned. I had a nice, leisurely day planned. Then the phone rang. I didn't see Patsy for the rest of the day. There's somebody on the phone crying. Who is this? It's Summer. Dennis is in the hospital. Blood pressure went up and he's having pains and I'm on my way there. Well, you think her day didn't change. Just went to work like any other day, and there's her husband. Fear of dying in a hospital. I got dressed the best I could and finally got on up to the hospital. I prayed for her over the phone. While I'm on the way, I get a text message from somebody else there that's in a hospital down here in Slidell. And so I went up there for a couple hours, came down here. You never know what a day's gonna be. Some days are good, some days are not so good. Some days are leisurely, some days are busy. But our relationship to our husband and wife ought to be strong in any and all situations. We should have learned that by now. Let me tell you what. Your mate cannot fulfill you without Christ at the center of your marriage. Your wife is not going to make your life great. And your husband is not going to make your life great. The only thing that will make your life great is the great God of creation and building and trusting in Him. And then look into your mate as someone you can help, not somebody to help you. And if they'll do their job, they'll be helping you. And it'll be a great, majestic crescendo of beautiful music radiating through your lives. Instead of that terrible drum beat. Day after day after day after day and no real joy and happiness in your life. If that's marriage, I'd be like Paul. Man, forget about it. I ain't getting married. I'm going to be single for the rest of my life. That's the best it's going to be. It should be the best thing in your life, not the thing that tears you down, but the things that builds you up. You submit to Christ's ability to solve situations. There are things that you cannot figure out and you'll never solve, but you go to Christ and ask Him to help you do it. And if you need to, get a Christ-centered person to help you. There's no shame in getting help. Ladies, if your car breaks down on the side of the road and it's a flat tire, you'd be glad to take some help, wouldn't you, change your tire? 
Guys, if you're out in your boat fishing somewhere and the motor breaks down, you can't get in, you'd be glad that somebody come along and give you a tow. You don't know how to do your work on the job, but you'd be glad for somebody to help you. Why not get some help in the most important relationship that you have on the planet? If you're married, get the help that you need. Marriage is a learning experience. You learn how to express and how to receive love. You have to learn. And I don't, you know what most of us do, and I'm guilty of this, I love Pat the way I want to be loved. Instead of loving her the way she needs to be loved. <laughs> you know, and you know, after all these years, you think I'd figure it out. Comes, comes present time, I give her stuff that plugs in the wall. Because I like stuff that plugs in the wall. She don't care about stuff that plugs in the wall. I just had a refresher course on that just this year. She explained some stuff to me, and I'm doing a lot better. After I gave her a million electronic devices, she's a lot happier with diamonds than she is with things that plug in the wall. Or flowers. Like my plastic flowers I told you I gave her. She likes her iPhone now. Yeah, after she threw it at me two times. Learn how to receive love. Be a receiver and a giver of love. And if you don't know what love is, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and go see what it says. Love is what? Patient. And it's kind. So go look at it close. It's almost the fruit of the Spirit. Doesn't keep a record of wrongs. We're not doing marriage counseling here, Jim. It's after services. <laughs> I love preaching to people I know. It's so much fun. <laughs> you go to some place you don't know anybody. You don't even know what's going on. I love preaching to you guys. Oh. We got time. I'm going to do this. I don't care. You need to learn how to experience sex. Uh-oh. They use a three-letter word in church. Oh, my God. What are you going to talk about now? Oh, I'll talk about anything. I don't care. <laughs> what most of you know about sex, you learn from your mother and dad. And they didn't know nothing. And they didn't talk to you very much. And then if you went to some goofball school, and they put you through some kind of sex education program, forget all that stuff. When's the last time you had a really good conversation about sex? Oh, man, everybody's, man, bro, everybody's squeezing down the chairs now. Honey, what can I do to make your sex experience with me better? What can we do to enjoy each other more? You know, God created this, friends. The devil didn't create it. God created it. The devil screwed it up, excuse that language, but he messed it up, and he made it ugly and shameful, and God never intended that. God's so cool, when he created Adam and Eve, he didn't even give them any clothes. Think about that for a while. I heard somebody spiritualize that one day. He said, oh, well, they had a holy glow about them. No, they didn't. The happiest guy who ever lived on the planet was Adam. He'd been looking at all them dumb animals, loving each other, and here comes Eve. Woohoo! Happy days, the most beautiful girl in the world, the only girl in the world. Ladies, you need to understand some things about your husband. And husbands, you need to understand some things about your wives. Your wife is not a sex object for you. Somebody said, good sex begins at breakfast. You got to have a relationship with your wife. And she knows that you love that you love her. She knows she needs to know that. She needs to know that you care. And that you're sensitive about her. And you want a sexual experience for her to be great. I'm telling you the truth. And then you gotta realize, men, they won't tell you this, but I'm gonna tell you this, because it's true. You know how many times a day men think about sex? 
all day long. And they try to get away from it, turn on the TV, and there it is. Blah! Guys, get it. Guys are interested in sex when they get up in the morning when they go to bed at night. You say, well, gee, that's, that's something. I don't know about that. Well, that's just the way it is. That's the way God created us. You need to understand that. Men don't, don't want to. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I can't wait till I get old enough that I don't have a sex drive anymore so that I don't feel like I'm begging to get sex from my wife. Christian couple. God told me that. The problem with this story, subject is it's so true and so close to your hearts, it scares you. You never talk about it. You ought to leave out of here. Instead of going to lunch with us, you ought to go home and talk about sex. About like your relationship. The existence or the non-existence of it. Somebody told me something the other day. They're, Doctor asked the guy about his uh, his sexual life, and he said, uh, "How often do you and your wife? How often are you intimate?" He said, "How many times a week is twice a year?" <laughs> I'm serious, folks. You know, I'm, I'm trying to lighten this up a little bit for you, but I'm serious about it. It's one of the biggest problems in marriages. They don't understand each other. You know, there's a lot of good, good books, Christian books that can help you in this area. Enough said. Enough said. Turn your home together over to Christ. Make, you, make your life Christ-centered. Make that decision to serve God together, love God together, and that God is the most important thing in your lives. And you want to have a great marriage for your partner to have a great marriage so you can have a great relationship with Christ. Making that number one priority. Stop the war of words. Just stop it. Learn how to fight fair. Learn how to communicate without anger. Learn how to communicate without being personal and using terrible words against one another. They just tear people down. Stop the war of indifference. I mean, you just don't care anymore. You just got to the point you just don't care. What's the point? You want to live that way for the rest of your life? Go right ahead, honey. Be like the guy in the Old Testament. But for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to find out what the truth is. We're going to learn. We're going to study. We're going to make something of our relationship so we can have a good marriage. All right, the last thing I want to talk to you about is you rekindle love from the flame of the Holy Spirit. You are going to love this passage of Scripture. You're going to fall in love with this. This is from the message, and it's out of the book of Hosea, chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. And now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start all over again. I'm taking her back out of the wilderness where we had, out into the wilderness where we had our first date. And I'll court her. I'll give her bouquets of roses. I'll turn Heartbreak Valley into Acres of Hope. Oh, I love that. She'll respond like she did as a young girl those days when she was fresh out of Egypt. This book of Hosea is a story about Gomer and Hosea. And it was, it, was a, well, it was a bad marriage from the beginning. I mean, it had a lot of bad problems. And God was really using it as a, as a mechanism to talk about Israel. But I won't get into all that because I want to just settle on this one thing, this one thought right here. You need to flame, get the flames going again. You need to do what this passage of Scripture said, start all over again. If, you had a, if your marriage is in trouble, just make up your mind, today I'm going to start over again. I'm going to do something about it today. Not tomorrow, but I'm going to do something about it today. I'm going to look at my wife. I'm going to look at my husband. I'm going to love them as Christ loves them. I'm going to see the beauty in them and the worth in them. 
Why, why God loved Pat so much that he gave his son for her. She is important in the kingdom. And if she's important in the kingdom, she ought to be important to me. Start all over again. Go back to the place where you loved each other. Go back to that place. Just maybe you got to sit down and talk about it. Maybe you got to get in a car and drive there. Maybe you got to get in a plane and fly there. Go back to where, where it all began and get a fresh start. Begin to court each other. Start doing some of those nice things you used to do. Call on the phone besides, hey, can you bring some, can you bring some bread and milk home? How's about, hey, baby, I was thinking about you today. Yeah, I was thinking about you. You know I love you. I appreciate you working for me so hard. I really do. I know it's hard out there. I know those people don't appreciate you, but I love you. I want you to know that. I want you to come home. I'm going to give you a, a nice dinner tonight when you get home. Man, it's going to be fun. I might even have a surprise for you. Okay, I see that. Bye. That'll brighten up a day. We'll brighten up a day. Hey, honey, you want me to get you some milk and eggs on the way home? You want me to pick up anything for you? I'm going by, I know. I, I, I got a little surprise for you, too. Maybe go by the floors, pick up some flowers. Go to Winn-Dixie, they sell them, they're cheap. They're not even expensive. They're pretty. Turn your life around to face Christ. Face Christ. Just, just make the commitment. Baby, I love you. We're married. And I want to go on from here. And I want to just, from this moment on, I want you to know that I'm going to serve God as best I can. I'm going to find out what God's word says. I'm going to, do, I'm going to be the best husband or wife that ever lived on the planet. And I'm going to invest my life in you. No more worrying about the job. No more worrying about money. I'm worried about you from now on. You've just moved up the priority ranks to number one. Oh, that'll do a lot for your marriage. How's it about responding to love? Don't touch me. I know what you want. How's about responding to love? You know, I love you, baby. I really do. I'm doing my best to show it. Well, let me show you how to love it. You know, sometimes, <laughs> guys are dumb as rocks. <laughs> Ladies, if you think all those little uh, hints and stuff you give that they get it, they don't get it. If you want them to do something, tell them. If you want them to bring you flowers, say, bring me flowers. And don't think, well, if I have to tell you, it doesn't matter. It does matter because a stone head will go get you some flowers. Because he knows that he wants to love you, but he doesn't know how. Wow. Determination and effort, all options on the table. You might have to change. Oh, pity me that I would have to change and do something different. What are you going to do with the rest of your life in your marriage? You're going to walk out here and be business as usual? If you do, shame on you and you deserve, you deserve to live a miserable life. Don't come crying to me in a week from now, a month from now. Oh, Pastor, my life is such a wreck. My husband doesn't love me. My wife doesn't love me. And we don't get along. And, oh, yeah. and I'm going to ask you, what did you do? I'm going to ask you if you got my sermon from today. If you say no, I'm going to say, give me a hundred bucks. I'll give you a copy of it. <laughs> Beloved, do something. Do something. It's not too late. It's really not too late. 
You can have you can be a bride and groom all over again. I'm gonna close with this one thought. This is the lyrics of a song that I ran across when I was thinking about this. <laughs> I'm gonna tell a story of myself. I'm not much for chick flicks. No, I gotta tell you. Give me a shoot 'em up. Yeah, give me a cowboy movie. Yeah, I love those. Uh, Pat wasn't at home. She was off someplace, uh, and I was flipping through the channels looking for something to watch. And that movie came on uh, with Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan about sleepless in, sleepless in Seattle. And it was at the end of the movie. This is kind of the best part. And it, go get that movie and just sit down with some popcorn or bottle of wine, whatever you need, and just enjoy it for a minute. But this is the lyrics out of one of the songs that they, they had in that movie. It says, make someone happy. Make just one someone happy. Make just one heart, the heart you sing to. One smile that cheers you. One face that lights when it nears you. One girl or guy you're everything to. Fame, if you win it, comes and goes in a minute. Where's the real stuff in life to cling to? Love is the answer. Someone to love is the answer. Once you've found him or her, build your life around them. Make someone happy. Make just one someone happy, and you will be happy too. Came right out of this Bible. <laughs> Let's all stand. Gracious Father, King of glory, Lord, let every word that I've spoke today that's of you take root within each of us. Start with me, Lord. Start with Pat. Start with my family. Let it take root and let it grow and produce beautiful, beautiful, fragrant flowers and bouquets. And Lord, anything I've said that's not of you, let it fall to the ground and be dust under our feet. That we will only take out of here, Lord, the things that you have determined for us to know and hear. Lord, help each of our families. Help everyone, Lord, even those who, who I don't know, maybe watching on the other side of the world via the internet. Lord, let your truth come to them. Help us, oh God, in our marriages to reflect the relationship between you, dear Jesus, and us, the church. Thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen and amen.